Today is our part three in this Joshua prophetic series. And as we're moving together towards the promised land, God is showing us from His Word, His principles that reveal to us how we are to enter into a promised land because it's never changed. You're going to see today, it's all about crossing the Jordan and the way we cross the Jordan and what that means and what it represents. And for me, I believe today is about speaking to us as God has declared over us and desires for us to be a Jordan crossing church. A Jordan crossing church. Why do I say that? Because even in, in Bible, it is, it is accepted to take where we often might see Israel in the Old Testament. And we can liken a lot of that, not all of it, but liken a lot of that to be for the church of today. And so although there is not literally only a move of God of Jewish people to cross the Jordan, but actually now in Christ, Jew and Gentile are one, and we can still walk and cross the Jordan. In fact, God wants us to cross the Jordan as a church. Now, in the language of Scripture, as we go there, you'll notice God's desire is that all cross, all cross, not some not the strongest, not the best. The same way all were released from Egypt, the language of Scripture is that all would cross. In fact, earlier we learned that God says, I want you to take all of my word and speak over all of my people so that they can all inhabit all of the promised land. Christianity is not about a select few possessing the promises of God. All in Christ get to possess all of the promised land. However, we learned last week that movement is a key part of what it is to possess the promised land, going towards the promised land. When Moses sent out his spies, including Joshua and Caleb, they came back, 10 of them saying, the land is great, Moses, but the giants in the land are greater. The the fruit is incredible, but the battle will destroy us. Yet Joshua and Caleb came back saying, Moses, all you asked us to do was find out if the land is good, see if it really is as amazing as we think it is, and come back with a report of what lies between us and the land. But what's interesting is Joshua and Caleb highlighted that there are giants, that there are enemies, but they said, our God is greater. We can take this land. And then we recognize that God said the reason why Joshua and Caleb were allowed to enter the promised land with their people was that they possessed a different spirit to the other spies. See, they both saw the same picture. You know, the other spies saw the same picture, but they saw something totally different. Some people will be looking right now at Corona and COVID and saying, we are going backwards. The world is going to take all our possessions. The church is going to close down. We are all finished. We're all doomed. Every government, every political movement, every person, nobody's safe, no country even knows what's going on. And they might see what we see, but the spirit in which they see something is the limitations and what's, what is greater than God. They look at it like there's no ways God can fulfill his promises. Yet I believe the spirit of God in Christ Jesus that rests upon us is one that doesn't only recognize that there's opportunity, but actually says God is setting us up. The question was, is the land good? The answer should have been the land is great. Are there obstacles? Yes, but our God has given us that land. You know, scripture tells us, God says, I gave that land to Moses. I gave that land to the people following Moses, but they never possessed it. Why? Because they never took the spirit that God wanted them to have saying, that is our land and went on to possess it. So when Joshua rises up with Caleb and says, it's our land. It's the land promised to Moses. It's the land promised to us. The spirit was, how big do you make God? Do you make God smaller than the obstacle? Is God smaller than COVID? Is God smaller than a currency fluctuation? Is God smaller than retrenchments? Is God smaller than what's going on in political upheavals and people's emotions? No, not at all. Yes, those things exist, but the land is awesome. And I believe as a church, we need to pick up the spirit of what is God doing? 
What is God doing? We got the most incredible testimony in recently. Somebody who was in South Africa, right, had emigrated to Europe, went for a job interview in the UK, in England. In the job interview, ended up talking with the person interviewing them who would end up being their boss. And the boss and this person in the interview started to speak about faith. In fact, Christianity. And somehow they got into the subject of watching church. It turns out that the person was in Redemption Church, South Africa, and has still stayed in Redemption Church because Redemption Church is about being connected. It's not about being in a geographical location. It's about receiving from this church, saying this is the ministry that feeds you, and you can be anywhere in the world and do church with us, right? So this person had left South Africa. They went to Redemption Church. They had joined our church, moved to the UK, went for a job interview, started sharing their faith, and the boss said, I'm a believer too. I also fellowship online. And the person at the interview asked the boss, where do you go to church? And the boss said, I have been going now during COVID to a church in South Africa called Redemption Church online. And the person being in the interview was like, that's the church I go to. How did you hear about Redemption Church? And the person giving the interview said they were sent one of our services by a friend of theirs in Belgium. And that through someone in Belgium, who's a part of watching Redemption Church online, they then fed on the gospel. Their life has been impacted. Their life was changed. They have been consuming the, the gospel with us every week since. And then there they are sharing their faith with someone who has come from South Africa, who's also in our church. That would never have happened before COVID. I believe God is growing his church. I believe God is preparing a promised land. But do we carry the spirit that sees the land or do we carry the other spirit that sees the obstacles? What do we choose to see today? The limitations of this life of this earth, the attacks of the enemy, or do we see the land is awesome? Promised land living. That's what God has for us in Christ Jesus. So we learned over the last few weeks that spirit is everything. In fact, I firmly believe the spirit on you and the spirit you carry far outweighs your skill and far outweighs strategy. In our church right now, we are searching our hearts that we carry that spirit. Because let me tell you something, this is not a church built on skill and strategy. Yes, those things are involved, but they're not priority. Priority is, yes, spirit. Yes, God can spirit. Yes, promised land is ours kind of spirit. Yes, the gospel releases a faith in me that says grace is gonna take me to places I've never gone. But we learned last week that that word, nevertheless, there are giants. Nevertheless, the land is good, but nevertheless will be squashed. That nevertheless word spoke about the joint of your ankle being locked and stopping the body from moving. That spirit that says, although it looks great, we can't go. Look at what's between us. So here we find ourselves at the Jordan, flowing in flood. At the time that the nation of Israel crosses the Jordan, it's in a one kilometer wide flooding. There was no swimming lessons back then. There was no, I mean, when a, when a river's in flood, you're not gonna get from point A to point B. That's how people drown. You get in and you get swept away by currents. And God positions them. Let's read together Joshua chapter three. Joshua rose early in the morning. He set out. They come to the Jordan. He says to the children of Israel, lodge there before they cross over. Three days, the officers go through the camp. They command the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the priests and the Levites bearing it, carrying it, you will set out from your place and go after it. There shall be a space between you and it, 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know by the way you must go. For you have not passed this way before. I want to highlight a few things quick. Number one, Joshua gets up early. He says, prepare. I'm telling you, church, prepare. Prepare. 
Get a preparing spirit in you. We're going somewhere. Some of you in Europe, you just came back from summer vacation. Some people in South Africa and in the Southern Hemisphere, we're trying to prepare for whatever we'll be allowed to do in vacation. But there's a preparing spirit. Pack your bags. Get ready. We're going somewhere. We're going to leave this place and we're going to go somewhere else. There's an adventurous spirit. Then we gather. And you know what the Bible says? Watch when the priests carry the ark and the Levites. So the leadership, the spiritual leadership lifts up the ark. Now the ark of the covenant is a type of Jesus. If you go and do a study on this on Google, it'll blow you away. But some of the things that are amazing is it literally is a type, a shadow, a picture of Jesus. It is made out of wood, which is earthly and laced with gold, which is a picture of divinity and righteousness. Jesus is human and he's divine. Inside of it are all the items representing the rebellion of man. And yet inside of Christ placed on him was all of the condemnation and the rebellion of man. On on the top is the mercy seat between two cherubim on which the blood of the innocent animal needs to be placed for the atonement of sin, right? And if we look Look at it, it is literally the blood on the crown, on the mercy seat that has to be placed, right? For what? For our cleansing, covering our sin, washing it away. So much of the ark's design and and pattern and process follows a, a, a literal depiction of what Jesus would fulfill. So the Bible is telling us the leadership of the church, myself, Tara, our pastors, our teams, our leaders, Every single person that is a part of the leadership of Redemption Church, we mustn't carry strategy. We mustn't carry skills. We mustn't carry money. Like money is what's going to produce this. It's all about having the money for the budget. It's all about having the skills and the talent and having the most talented people. No, we are to pick up Jesus. We are to elevate Jesus. And the ark goes first, carried by the priesthood. So here's a side note. This church can never go where the leadership have never been. The Bible says the whole nation's never been this way before, right? But who goes first? The leadership. Myself and Tara and our leadership. We need to carry Christ for ourselves and go ahead. We need to go towards the promised land before you. We cannot sit back and wait for you to move and then come from, the, from behind and let you go first. No, we have to go first. Why? Because we need to bear the ark. We need to pick up the gospel and we need to walk. And what happens is, look at this. Now we're going to go to verse six. Take up the ark of the covenant and cross over the Jordan before the people. Now remember, it's in full flood. Joshua is telling people to do something that makes no sense because in the natural, it's in full flood. God is telling us as a church of redemption to dream, to get ready, to prepare, to occupy promised land. I am dreaming about places we can go, countries we can occupy, cities we can take the gospel to, prime buildings. We're not in them right now. It's impossible in it right now. There's no way you could expect growth in Corona, but I have prepared myself in the spirit of God saying, this church is going to cross the Jordan towards the promised land. Because that's what God has called us to. Cities and nations. There are millions of people around the world waiting for us to lift the Ark of the Covenant and go a way that no one's ever gone before. So Joshua is telling them to cross. But the response should be, um, the, the, the circumstances, uh, our leader Joshua, the circumstances, they're not conducive to crossing. I mean, we get, we get it. Jericho is there. It's fantastic. Um, there is a way we, we might, by some miracle, overcome those giants. But, 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 but before we even get to that battle, let's talk about the reality that, that the Jordan is in full flood. You know, in mine and Tara's life right now, everything is under attack. I, I'm not giving, I, I don't, I'm not even going to give the devil his weight. But here's the deal. This is the worst time for us to be talking about going somewhere in the natural. We should, we should be backing off, stepping down. But here's the thing. It's not about the natural circumstance. It's about responding with your spirit to the prophetic word God speaks and saying, yes. Do you know an entire tribe of Israel never crossed? 
they had already decided prior to this moment to stay behind in the wilderness. Why? If you study your scripture, you'll see they say the wilderness where they were had grass, it had, it had food, it had nourishment. It, it didn't have promised land living, but they were not prepared to go with the nation on this adventure towards the promised land. And they stayed. An entire tribe never entered the promised land, never ate of the fruit of the promised land, never lived in the, never got to partake in that victory and have that incredible life. God's not going to judge people. He's judged your sin already on Jesus. He's not going to judge you for saying no to this. But man, are you going to miss out on the greatest adventure of your life. I, I, I am not going to get to the end of this natural life and say, what if I, what if I, what if, what if I had just given it a go? You know, Christianity right now is under so much pressure because what's getting challenged is, are we just about coffee and hanging out in events and nice light shows? And, and are we just about going to a place and seeing our friends? Or are we taking Jesus with us into our workplace, into our lives? Are we praying over our family, receiving communion in our home, trusting God with our finances? Yes, the gathering of the church right now is not happening naturally in buildings, but we can still sit at the feet of Jesus. The church is not Martha, it should be Mary. We shouldn't be worrying about where we're meeting, how we're meeting, how many people, who's sitting and neglecting sitting at the feet of Jesus. You can sit at the feet of Jesus all day, every day right now. In fact, you can enjoy more of Jesus than you ever have been able to before. And yet we focus on the deed of church the tradition and the customs, yet there are people in your life right now, in your workplace, in your family, who are desperate, who are depressed, who are oppressed, who are suicidal, who have no hope. And here we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, the testimony of our own, and we're placed in their lives. What a great time for us to be awakened into a personal walk with Jesus, where it's not just about consuming content, but living the gospel out where people are living. Yes, we will gather again, and I believe fully we will see an explosion in our church attendance, an explosion in the gatherings in our buildings. But let's not wait for that to be a part of our revival. Let's say yes now, even when the Jordan's in full flood, carrying Jesus, we can follow the church leadership into the promised land. It's the best time to move now because it's only supernatural if something happens now, and it will. And as they go to the Jordan, look at this. Joshua says in verse seven, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So God says to Joshua, I'm gonna elevate you to lead people. You know, uh, myself and Tara, we're not interested in being famous, but God is elevating us to speak his word and to release a faith for the church to go where it needs to go. I believe God wants to use us to be a part of leading leaders who lead nations into the promised land. And so here, look at what it says. Go and stand in the Jordan. The leadership needs to take the Ark of the Covenant and stand in the Jordan. We don't wait for the Jordan to dry up. We go and stand where the Jordan is flooding. Our feet get wet with the Ark. And as we go, God says, I will reveal myself. I will show myself in the setting to be with you as I was with Moses, right? So verse 10, Joshua says, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he is without fail. He will drive from before you all of your enemies. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord is crossing over before you. Jesus is going in front of you into the Jordan, carried by the priests. Now therefore take yourselves, 12 men, one from every tribe. So take its leadership and it shall come to pass as the soles of the feet of the leadership of the tribes with the priests who are carrying the ark of the Lord. As they go in the water, the waters shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. And so it was as they set out to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the ark of the covenant, as they came, as they stood carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they stood in the Jordan, what happened? The water started to recede. 
And the waters went all the way back, right? To what? As far away in verse 16 as the city of Adam. The city of Adam. Why is that significant? Well, first and foremost, we already know now the priesthood are carrying the ark, Jesus, as they go and stand in the waters of Jordan. And these waters, these rushing waters, they represent death, they represent destruction, and they come all the way from the city of Adam. What is it that Jesus helped us to conquer, right? The sin and death that reigned on this earth through one man, through Adam, how much more will the grace, favor, goodness, and righteousness of God reign through Christ Jesus? How much more will we not reign over all the things that came through the first Adam through what the last Adam accomplished? So as the ark gets in the waters of judgment, what happens? It recedes. The judgment goes back all the way to Adam and it stays there. It's heaped there. Jesus gives us a judgment-free dry crossing, right? Because the priests are carrying the ark. Here's a cool side note. For those of you in leadership or those of you that are feeling a stirring to say yes to redemption and will end up in leadership, because make no mistake, we might be a church of thousands right now, but in time to come, we will be a church of hundreds of thousands and millions one day because it's about the gospel spreading and it's about leaders and leaders and leaders and disciples and disciples and disciples. This is not about a man, it's about the man. And as you are raised into leadership, including myself, I'm preaching to me right now and our room of leaders, listen to me. The Ark of the Covenant is too heavy for the priesthood to carry. It was so heavy that if they had stood on the river crossing, they would have sunk. But the language in which this incredible encounter is written is it's literally depicted in the Hebrew that the ark carried the priests. As they, in their weakness, put their shoulders under the ark, it pulled them up and it pulled them above ground. And the ark carried the priesthood not the priesthood carried the ark. You don't have to carry the burden of representing Jesus. He's already represented you fully and perfect. This is not about you carrying his gospel. He can carry it himself. In fact, as you align with the call of God on your life, yes, you have an attack from the enemy, but the power of Christ pulls you up and you are stronger because of who you are attached to. You are wiser because of who you are looking to. You are not walking the ark across, the ark is walking you across. And that's such a powerful revelation because it's never a demand. There is a supply when we line up with the ark. And as they cross, what's so beautiful is it says that the priests who bore the ark of the covenant stood on firm dry ground in verse 17. In the midst of the Jordan, so the priesthood went into the Jordan, they got the waters to recede in response to the ark, and then they stood in the middle of the river. So they didn't cross first. They went in first and then they stood in the middle and the language of the scripture says they stood still until all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan. The leadership of our church is not to convince people to come. Some people are not gonna come. Some people are never gonna go for the promised land living. That's okay. Some tribes are gonna stay behind. But our responsibility as leadership and as the church leadership is to stand in the middle until all who are crossing, cross. We don't put pressure on people. Imagine, imagine the elderly who needed time. Imagine the kids who get distracted. Imagine the fear that the waters are gonna come from Adam and flood us out. No, as long as the ark and the leadership remain in the middle, holding the ground, all who are crossing get to cross. So this is never about pushing something on you and pressing something out of you. But know this, as you respond to the call to cross, God will wait for you to get there. This is a step in front of a step. It's not a, per, it's not a perfect race. If you go a bit left in the direction of the promised land, God will bring you back. If you stub your toe, God will wait. If you get a bit distracted, if, it's a bit, if it takes a bit more time. Often pastors 
put a pressure like this has to happen now, this has to happen now, this has to happen now. And although we're passionate, we have to always remember when God's in it, we'll cross. He'll be patient for us. You, you might be watching today and you were so passionate about the Lord, but it's been a rough corona period. You've had a few weeks, uh, a few moments where you've just gone back to the wrong stuff, back to this, being depressed, being oppressed, disconnected from church for a season or being bitter or hurt or, or uh, whatever's gone on. Listen, God is patient for you to cross. As long as you are moving towards, not away from. You know, if you're going to go back, you're going to go back. But if you're going to cross... God will wait until all get to cross. I, 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 in our next part, uh, I'm going to speak about the battle being the Lord's because there is such powerful revelation about how we give the battle for Jericho, the battle for the promised land to God and what that is to stand because it's, it's going to be an incredible ending to this part of our church. But prophetically, I want to invite you into the adventure God is calling redemption to. It's a calling for all the church, but I'm accountable for redemption. Those of you watching in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in America, in Israel, South Africa, of course, um, there's literally Hungary is, is birthing a move of God. Like, Whatever you're watching from, this is what I want to invite you into. I want to invite you. Yes, you literally have a Joshua leading you. And the Bible's very clear. Joshua is given charge to speak instruction over the priests and the leaders. But this is not, this is not Joshua's promised land. It's the nation's promised land. I, I firmly believe with all my heart the gospel of Jesus Christ which reveals and releases the grace of God to us should literally ignite a radical faith that with the ark, we go anywhere. We go where we've never gone before, but we go knowing that even when we encounter Jordan flooding rivers, as we go in obedience to God, as we prepare ourselves to leave this place for where God is taking us. And I'm not talking about only geographical changes, although I am sure some of you I'm speaking to right now, I'm mentioning countries and nations and people, and you're like, I have a passion for my city. I have a passion for that nation. I have a passion for what God's going to do. Yes, that gets stirred, but let's Always carry the spirit that we don't camp in the wilderness. So many people are okay with average. They're okay with, well, imagine if, if our picture of God's power on earth is just that we know Jesus. Think about the people who don't know. I never, ever will forget this moment. When Tara and I were in a very busy shopping center a few years ago, we lost our middle child, Joel. And we didn't lose him for a moment. We lost him for about five minutes. And that shopping center, that area in Johannesburg, South Africa, has actually had quite a few child trafficking abductions where children have gone missing and, and, and some of them have been found, some of them never found. And we completely panicked because we had already read on the news a few weeks earlier, a child had been stolen from their family. It's a really busy place and there's a lots of different directions to go. And we lost Joel. And I will never forget the panic that hit me in terror as we still had Jonathan and we were literally carrying Hannah and we were trying to figure out what to do. And I had Jonathan by me and I was carrying Hannah and Tara was running up and down aisles, screaming for Joel, panicking, freaking out. And I was saying to people in security and people sitting in restaurants, have you seen our child? He looks like this. And I'll never forget the absolute apathy one person had. And they were like, um, have, you, have, you, have you just not looked where you've been? Like, maybe he's where you were. I'm like, um, I would do that, and I have done that. And the reason we are panicking is because every logical explanation for where he is has gone unanswered, and we don't know where he is. He's not where we were, he's not where we are, and now we don't even know where he's going and what's happened. I remember asking the security and we had people walkie-talking and phoning and getting on the camera surveillance and it was absolute pandemonium for about five minutes and then Tara found him literally up an entire aisle a few hundred meters away in a corner by a, by a toilet. 
And, and she found him. And as she found him, she brought him back. She basically passed out from the shock. She had to sit down from the, from, and I can, I will never forget the Holy Spirit saying to me, and I just had that moment. Imagine if people's response to me in that moment was, you still have two other children. You lose one, you still have two. Focus on the positives. We sit as the church and we talk about our community. We talk about our coffee, our leaders, our friends. And we celebrate that a few hundred of us gather in a room while a few hundred thousand don't even know Jesus within meters of our buildings. What good is the grace of God if it only stops with me? Look at the, look at the Bible. The book of John says, yes, I love because he first loved me, but now in response, I love him and I love others. Don't stop at the lowest level of Christianity, which is, I am blessed. Rise up and be the gospel to those in your life. And as we've heard today, that's not a burden because the ark will carry you. You don't need to stress about having your life perfect. You don't need to stress about arguing doctrine and you don't have to carry Jesus. You say yes to the call and he will carry you. I am not doing what I'm doing because I'm skilled and I'm strategic and I'm talented. I had I, a funny story is I remember, I don't know about you, but I grew up in church and I used to have these youth camps and every two years at youth camp, I would rededicate my life to Jesus because I went to a secular school, which means normal people who don't believe in Jesus. And I would find myself living in the world and then I would come back to youth camp, feel convicted because I feel a call of God in my life and I would rededicate, recommit my life. Okay, Jesus, I'm gonna live for you. And then the next six months, I did nothing but sin. God's not asking you to live a life for him that earns righteousness. He has lived that life for you to give it to you. So now when you line up with him, you just say, God, just use me as a vessel. Don't try, be perfect. Just say, I'm gonna put myself in that place. Uh, receive the gospel of Jesus Christ every day, receive the edification that comes by the word and then just live it. it and the most amazing thing is me who literally said no to full-time ministry because literally I said, I can't live that Christian life. Today, here I am pastoring a church in many nations. Here, here I am leading talking about us going to change the world for the gospel. It's not me. I can, I can, I, I, please listen to me today. I am nothing but a broken, fallen man in my flesh. But when I step in my place and I line up with the Ark of the Covenant and I say yes to the call to possess the promised land, not just for me, but for our people, for the bride of Christ, for every single other person, think of the people whose lives will be impacted by the people who we share the gospel with. Don't even think about the people you share the gospel with. Think about the people they will share the gospel with when they're encountered. Think of the multiplication effect of salvation, righteousness, healing, wholeness, when we rise up and say yes to the call of God. This is a Jordan crossing church. We're not gonna stay in the wilderness because it has grass, it has manna, it has, it has comfort zones, it's easier. No, that's not what we're called to do. That's not, we didn't start Redemption Church with 30 people in a, in a farm holding. I mean, we can even pull up photos now. We were 30 people in a small holding. We were in a little warehouse in the middle of nowhere. We didn't start it because we wanted to have a gathering for ourselves. We've always had a passion that the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, that the grace revolution would pour out across this earth and shake cities and nations as it establishes the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile. Why? Because time is short. And why else? What else? There's nothing else better than living for the Lord. What an honor and what a privilege to say yes. You know, I want to encourage you today. You don't need. Do you notice that when Joshua said we're crossing, he never once asked, are the people acting holy? How is their religious life? How is their skill sets? How is their track record? He just said, you're here, 
you're in the nation of Israel. In other words, you've believed. You're a part, like to the church. It's like you believe on Jesus. Yes. You're, a, you're listening today. Yes. Well, come. Come. Well, how are we going to cross? No, don't worry. The ark will cross before you. The ark will push the waters back. And the ark will remain as long as you are prepared to cross. It's all Jesus. But you have to, in faith, get out the boat and walk. In faith, rise up and pick up your mat. In faith, come forth. In faith, respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's never going to force it on you. He invites you into this incredible life, this adventure of seeing what Jesus can do with a group of people. You know, it was just a handful of people that got filled with the Holy Spirit. And God said, Jerusalem, and I think they would have been like, that's tough, but that's okay. Judea, wow, okay. Some of us have never been out of Jerusalem, but fine. Samaria, mm, now we're talking about people we don't like, people that don't fit in our cultural boundaries, and the rest of the world. Wow, okay, the world, there's a world. I just thought it was Israel. Uh, I, I, I didn't even. God's calling us to go everywhere there's people. Everywhere where there's people, that's where the gospel needs to go. That's where the church needs to be established. That's where the gospel needs to be preached. People need to be discipled. Leaders need to be raised. Generations need to be impacted. And as long as we, the leadership of the church and the leadership wherever the church goes and everyone in our church, as long as we raise the ark, lift up the ark, let the ark go first with us as we step, we're going to see God provide. So wherever you're watching from right now, I want to invite you, we're going to pray two prayers. The first prayer we're going to pray is for people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And we want to invite you not into a life of religious commitment, but into a life of relationship with God through Jesus. The Bible is so clear. Salvation is all about receiving what Jesus did at the cross for you, making it personal. So we are going to lead you in a prayer right now that you just repeat after me that invites Christ to be the Lord of your life and your life will never be the same again. I'm not asking you about church attendance, where you come from, what you're doing, where you are. I'm asking you, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? So pray with me, repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today I declare, you are my Lord, you are my Savior. All my sin, past, present and future, you have washed away. Today, I'm a new creation. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, please let us know. There's websites, you can comment below. And if you're watching on social media, you can email us. But we really wanna send you a whole bunch of free resource as a gift to celebrate the decision you've just made and give you so much more to know about Jesus. We would love to hear from you. And so many of you every single week, let us know that you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So do it again today if you pray that for the first time. Now I wanna pray a prayer with our church. I wanna pray a prayer over our church in every language, in every tribe, every tongue. We're gonna speak the gospel over you. And we are gonna speak a release into where we're going because it's not about us. It's not about our money, our skills, our talent, our strategies. It is about obeying the call of the Lord into the impossible, into the unknown on this adventure that will see us be a part of something so special. It's not about you. It's about are you prepared to say yes to Him and just come and go, not knowing what the plan is, not knowing what the strategy is, but knowing that the ark is determined to take us into the promised land. Father, I thank you for each and every single person in redemption, every single person, a believer in Jesus watching this right now in all the nations of the world, in all the languages of the world. God, I know you are calling your church to make your name even brighter, even more known. God, that this is the time for the church to rise. As the world gets darker, the church of Jesus Christ gets brighter. And I thank You that every single heart and spirit watching this that is called into this journey, God is graced, is favoured, is anointed and appointed to be used by You mightily in this body, in this bride. 
Father, I thank You for a supernatural faith response to the grace of Jesus Christ telling redemption, prepare. We are crossing the Jordan. We are going where you've never been and we are going to occupy territory that has never been occupied before for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the call of preaching the gospel to Jew and Gentile. I speak a supernatural favour and anointing. Every weapon formed by the enemy shall not prosper in our homes, in our marriages, in our bodies, in our health, in our churches, in our teams, Father, in our communities, in our small groups, unity, passion, faith, favour, grace, a yes spirit is birthed, is released, is given. The spirit that God wants us to carry, that sees the promised land, not the problems, that sees the opportunity, not the obstacles, and that ties itself to the Ark of the Covenant because we will be carried by it. We do not carry it, it carries us. Jesus raised will lift us all for the glory of God. We speak that, we believe it, and we receive it in Jesus' name. Now we're gonna receive communion together, which is such a special moment. Wherever you're watching around the world, just grab your bread and your juice and we're gonna speak over our lives, the supply that Jesus has given us at the cross. Father, we speak over the bread, which is the body of Christ, that Jesus went through all suffering at the cross for our healing and our wholeness. That Jesus has been through it all so that we do not need to receive a sick diagnosis as a permanent diagnosis. We don't need to live in fear of sickness and disease, but we know that Jesus has supplied. And as the enemy attacks, and even if some of us are feeling symptoms or experiencing attack even in our home right now, we lift up the finished work of Jesus, the broken body of Jesus for us for our healing and we declare healing is ours, wholeness is ours, disease must flee in Jesus name. As we break this, we receive together. Thank you, Father. Healing and wholeness is ours. Thank you, Jesus. Sickness is driven from the midst of our homes, from our lives. We thank you, Lord God. And the blood of Jesus is shed for all sin, all mistakes, all unrighteousness. God has given His best for us that cleanses us once and for all. And today as we receive the blood of Jesus, we declare we are precious children of God with a plan, with a purpose, with a future, with a hope. In Christ Jesus, the promised land is ours. In Jesus' name, we receive. Amen, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. I pray that today's word blessed and touched you. Let us know if you experienced something, if something happened on the inside, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to hear the testimony of how God used us to impact you. Until we see you again, stay safe, be blessed, and know that grace is greater than any obstacle you face. From us at Redemption Church, have an incredible day.